Okay, we talked about the baptistry. Did we talk about St. Francis? All right. I think we left on this slide right here. Duicento. Do you know what Duicento means? All right, uh, Dewey Cento is Italian for the 1200s. And then we're going to get into the Trecento, which is the 1300s. We'll get in next semester, we'll do the Quattrocento, which is the Renaissance in the 1400s. And then we'll do the Quincecento for the 1500s. And that also, <laughs> excuse me, is um, uh, Renaissance. All right, so we're going to talk about painting today. And with Dewey Cento painting, we're talking about altar pieces. All righty, that was fun. It's not a Friday without a fight in the hall, so. Okay, all right, so we're, uh, we're talking about altar pieces. You should know what an altar is, right? It's that table thingy in a church. <clears throat> the priest will put the uh, Bible on it. They'll put other things on it. So in our world, in a church, we'll have an altar piece behind the altar. It is a piece of decoration. It has some uh, images in it. And this will be a pretty typical altarpiece in a church that we might go to. However, in the Gothic era, in the Renaissance era, in this in-between era, uh, we're talking about some really big altarpieces. If you look at the image on the left, that tiny little table down at the bottom that is the altar. So you see it's got some candles on it. It's got some other things on it. And the altar piece takes up all this space right here. Now, this would be an altar piece in a cathedral. You can see the giant windows behind it. And um, the altar piece has to compete with all the spectacle of a cathedral around it. So it's got to be big. And the uh, altar piece on the right, we'll discuss that one uh, next semester. All right, so we're going to go to Italy, and then we'll go to the Church of Francesco of Pescia, and we're going to look at the St. Francis altarpiece. It's about five feet tall, so St. Francis is about uh, life size on this, temper on wood, and Again, we are in the in-between area between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Uh, this image right here doesn't really show much naturalism. Remember when we left off with uh, Gothic art, uh, those images, uh, the, especially the sculptures and the jam uh, figures, became more and more lifelike. Well, in Italy, 
at the same time where they are also becoming more and more lifelike, but this is before that. He has scenes of his life around him. And it depicts him as a person blessed by God. So who was St. Francis? <clears throat> he was born into privilege and wealth. Uh, but he had a religious experience as a young man, and he decided to renounce all of his worldly possessions. So he took his expensive clothes off that he was wearing, and he threw them at his father. Can you imagine your son uh, stripping naked and throwing his clothes at you? All right. But his message is follow the examples of Christ and live a life of poverty. So there is a uh, gold background which is a symbol of heaven and holy light. And it's done in a medieval style. There's distorted proportions, this long figure. He almost looks like a jam figure. The weightlessness, remember the weightlessness in Byzantine art, the gold background of Byzantine art. So these, <coughs> these artists are looking back to the Byzantine and the Gothic, the early Gothic for their influences. And there's no sense of a body under that fabric. And the brown rope, the rope belt, the bare feet, these are all symbols that he has renounced all pleasures of the world, that he is humble. Also, I want to point out that he's got holes in his hands and holes in his feet. That is called the stigmata. And I want you to write this term down, stigmata. We're going to see this word again next semester. So he is um, uh, feeling the same pain that Christ felt. And these wounds appeared miraculously on the body of St. Francis. <clears throat> and then all around him are scenes from his life. These are called the apron scenes. Here he is praying to, uh, he's alone in the wilderness and he is praying to a seraphim and gets the stigmata. This is how he gets the stigmata. And I bet you're wondering, what is a seraphim? Well, there's different kinds of angels. And here is what a seraphim looks like. It looks like an eyeball with a bunch of feathers and wings around it. And we have, what, nine types of angels in the, up here, and seven of them look like people. And two of them do not. And here's some cool fan art of Seraphim. All right, here's another scene where he is preaching to the birds. And that is a metaphor for teaching to the poor. He's teaching to people that don't understand. So he's teaching to everybody. And then we have him performing a miracle. He healed a, a crippled man. And here he is. Uh, curing a, uh, uh, an exorcism. All right. So the influence of this is definitely from the icons of the Byzantine Empire. So we are over here in Italy. The Byzantine Empire is not far away. And uh, uh, artworks are coming out of the Byzantine Empire, coming to Italy. And people are seeing the artworks of the Byzantine Empire. So the artists are looking to these old uh, Byzantine uh, images and, uh, you know, using them as influence. All right, we're going to go to Florence. I want you to know where Florence is because we're going to talk about it in the beginning of next semester. Bless you. All right, we're going to go into this church and we're going to take a look at this painting right here. Again, oh, this gives you a sense of how large this painting is. We are still looking at altar pieces. So this would have been in a church behind the altar. <coughs> All right, so notice the gold background. That is a reference then again to Byzantine art. 
And then uh, what I want to point out on this picture is uh, there is a new attempt at some realism here. They're trying to make it look like she is sitting on a throne in real space. So we can we are looking down at the bottom of the throne and the uh, the armrests of the throne. So there's a an attempt at linear perspective here. Do you remember that when the Romans attempted linear perspective? It looks kind of realistic, but not really. All right, so that's kind of what we're going for here. But there's an impossible space down here at the bottom. Remember that we are looking down at the uh, the chair, the throne, and the top here. You can see that we can see the top of this up here. Let me back up just a little bit. We can see the top. like We can see where she's putting her feet. And then we can see the top here. But we are looking straight at the people. So it's like our eyes are seeing the top and in front. So it's an impossible space. We're in two places at once. Oh, and then these guys are evangelists because they are holding the scrolls. And they are the Old Testament prophets. And then around her, she has angels. But I want to look more closely at her, uh, her fabric here. And the highlights of the fabric are gold lines, which is kind of odd. So it looks rather flat. And we'll talk about this in a minute as we go into Trecento painting. We have our first big rock star artist and that is Giotto. Be sure to write his name down, know him. So in this room here, we have these three altar pieces. The one on the right is one that we just looked at. We're gonna look at the one in the center. And this gives you a sense of how large this artwork is. And as we get a little bit closer, we can see some of the details in it. And we can also compare it to the others. These all have the gold background. They have the gold halos. And we can see uh, subtle differences in the ones that we were looking at. I really want to point out over here on the right how she has uh, this gold. This is the one we just looked at, how she has the gold highlights. And then Giotto uh, has these. Uh, it, it's not that way. And, we'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. But if you compare the two, which one looks more realistic? Yeah, the one on the right, Jotos, all right? And that and the reason why it looks more realistic is because he uses this uh, uh, technique called chiaroscuro. And I have a little story. Um, this... Uh, when I was in college the first time and I was taking an art history class, my first art history class, and uh, it was uh, like 1989, 1990. And the professor that I was taking this from wanted us, wanted us all to remember the correct pronunciation for Chiaro Scudo. So she made us over pronounce whenever we talked about it. So she made us go chiaro scuro and uh, really move our mouths in, in a very awkward way. But uh, so then um, we learned how to say chiaro scuro. Now, in my very next class, I was taking art three and my professor in that class called it churro scuro. All right, so uh, you can pronounce it however you want, <laughs> okay? But anyways, chiaroscuro is basically shading from light to dark. If you look at the, uh, the fabric over here on the right, you can see that it's highlighted right here on her knee. And it, <clears throat> in some parts, it has a slow change from that light bluer, the lighter blue to the darker blue. And then sometimes there's a sudden change from the light blue to the to the darker blue. And uh, that helps to give us the sense that it is 
uh, bending in space and catching light and causing shadow. Uh, and then over on the left side, it is very flat. We don't we don't really see the change in light because they've done it with these harsh uh, gold lines, which is an odd artistic choice. But, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, I have here an example of the difference between chiaroscuro and uh, not chiaroscuro. Oh, on the left, we have this ball, this sphere drawn in uh, with shading. Notice the subtle changes in uh, uh, lightness or darkness. And then on the right, we have a cartoon from a newspaper. And it, the newspaper cartoons back in the 60s, 50s, uh, had to make their art very cheaply. And so they did it very quick, very cheap. And so they did not <coughs> care to have a nice uh, transition from light to dark. So we have these harsh shadows of black and white. There is no gray in between. It's either black or it's white. And it creates no sense that it is rounded, that it's catching light or shadow. Uh, it is just flat shapes. All right, so we're going to watch this quick two-minute video explaining chiaroscuro. If you want your painting or your drawing to look realistic, to look naturalistic, to look like the observable world, then a technique that art historians call modeling or chiaroscuro is critical. Chiaroscuro means simply light and dark. And what we're talking about is the modulation or the transition from light to dark. When we look around objects in space, parts of it will be more brightly illuminated. And parts of it, especially as they move away from us, will be more in shade. And the ability to render that on a two-dimensional surface on a canvas can create the illusion of volume and mass of a thing in space. And here we're looking at Titian's Venus of Urbino, this lovely nude reclining on a bed. And I immediately get the sense that this is a three-dimensional body. Look, for instance, at her right thigh. It's bright at the top, but as the knee turns, it turns to shadow. It doesn't do it sharply, but as a result, her shin seems to recede into space. Or we can even follow the line of her thigh down toward the bed and see how it moves from brighter illumination into shadow. Yeah, Tisha was able to achieve this with such delicacy because he's using oil paint, which allows for a very fine modulation of tone. But we see this with Renaissance artists going back, for example, to Giotto, all the way through the artists of the High Renaissance, the artists of the Venetian Renaissance, like Tisha. If we looked back at earlier medieval representations in Italy, we would often see a line used to define the folds or the bunching of drapery. But here, if you look at the sheet under the figure, you can see that he's used only light and shadow to create the folds and creases in that cloth. And that older linear way of representing the three dimensions of drapery is not as naturalistic as this use of modeling or chiaroscuro that we see in the Renaissance. And there you have it, chiaroscuro. All right, we are going to move on. All right, so... Uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about with this painting, and it gives the sense of uh, a three-dimensional space, is that they, this little, like, little tiny closet of a room that she's sitting in has these doors that swing out into our space. And that also gives us the feeling that this is a three-dimensional space. And then uh, it also presents us at our eye level. If we could, we are looking up when we see uh, uh, in here, and like the, the there's an, a sense of linear perspective. They still haven't perfected it, but they're getting closer to it. So if we uh, uh, align these uh, areas up here and it goes down towards the center, and then there's a line down here that goes towards the center, and they will meet at our eye level. All right, I've got a little story to tell you. Actually, this is a big one. All right, so in up in heaven, before people, there were angels and there was God and there was Jesus. Now, uh, this is before Lucifer uh, became the devil. Lucifer was an angel up in heaven. And Lucifer was jealous of Jesus because <clears throat> Jesus was the favorite 
of God. And so uh, that made Lucifer very angry. And he started a revolt for, uh, with the other rebellious angels. So Lucifer leads a revolt against God. But God gives him the smackdown. And the uh, heaven kicks out all of the rebellious angels. And they become the devil and uh, uh, the demons that are down there. Anyways, when Lucifer strikes the earth, he strikes it with such force that it creates this this seismic event where so we have here this is the earth on the right and i'm gonna go see if I can go all right this is earth on the right and lucifer uh crashes down to earth and falls all the way through earth and gets uh caught in the center of the earth so this is where Lucifer is. Now, the, the force, when he fell, created this cavern behind him. So imagine an ice cream cone without any ice cream in it. This is what has uh, uh, been created in his wake. So there are all these rings that get smaller and smaller and smaller with an open space in between, inside the rings. Does that make sense to you? All right. It's an ice cream cone. Now, the force of creating this negative ice cream cone pushed all of the earth up here on the opposite side of the earth and created purgatory. Now, and then, so there's this mountain that is exactly the same size and shape as this cavern down here on the opposite side of the earth from Jerusalem. <coughs> all right, so, and then uh, here in the medieval... Italian uh, Catholic view, the Roman Catholic view of uh, heaven and hell. There are different layers to heaven as well. All right. Now, I want you to write this guy's name down, Dante Alighieri. He is a poet. And he writes uh, this book, or he writes these three poems called The Divine Comedy, and I want you to write down the title of the book, The Divine Comedy. In your uh, English classes, have you ever read a very long poem, like a poem that's as long as a book? Okay. So, uh, in this poem, he is lost, all right? He, he, he wakes up in the middle of a forest and he's lost and he cannot find his way home. And so he gets Virgil to help him. Virgil is a Roman poet. And so Dante and Virgil uh, have to go through hell and purgatory and then Virgil uh, leaves him and uh, Dante then goes through heaven in order to find his way back home. So here is the layers of hell. There are these different rings of hell. And the closer you are to Satan or Lucifer, the worse your sins in life were. Then at the very entrance of hell, this is the entrance over here on the left. And on the very entrance is a place called Limbo. And this is for all the people who lived before Christ that were good people, all the uh, uh, people of the uh, the Old Testament, all right, Moses uh, um, and other characters from the Old Testament who were good people. They just didn't know Christ, and you have to know Christ in order to get into heaven. So this area of hell called limbo is just a hangout place. You know, they're just hanging out. They're not being tortured. They're just hanging out in the dim light. Because in the dim light is reference to not knowing God. And then uh, there are the people who are lustful and gluttony. And, you know, these sins like are not so bad. But as you get down lower and lower, you get to the wrathful and you get to the people that um, <laughs> betrayed uh, uh, their country, betrayed God. 
And, and those that betrayed God are way down at the uh, bottom with Satan. And here's another view of the different rings of hell. And so Dante goes on this adventure through uh, in, uh, the inferno, which is hell. Uh, here's a view of the limbo where they're all just hanging out. The lustful are being blown around because they like the the sin of lust is that you're going with your passions you're being blown around by your passions and so their uh their punishment is to be blown around that's not so bad you know it might be annoying to be blown around uh gluttony uh these people are in the freezing rain and they are being forced to eat mud Greed. These people are pushing giant bags of money around. The wrath. They are in a, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a river and they are all fighting each other. All right. They are all uh, um, in constant turmoil. Then Dante and Virgil come to the city of Dis. And this separates upper hell from lower hell. And there's demons there that will not let them pass, even though uh, they need to pass in order to get to um, uh, Dante's home. So an angel comes down from heaven and moves the uh, demons out of the way, opens the door so that they can pass. And this shows that uh, heaven has control of hell. All right. In the uh, once they get in, they meet with the heretics. These people are inside of their tombs. And the tombs are on fire. All right. So the, yeah. So uh, these are the atheists, all right? There is, and people that believe that there is no life after death. So to live it, live it up now. Those you heard the term YOLO. All right. You only live once. All right. And they are in the burning tombs. And when the judgment day comes, the tombs will be closed and they'll be stuck inside their burning tombs forever. <clears throat> in circle seven, we have the violence against the fellow men and they are in a river of boiling blood. Now, you notice that some people are waist deep and then this guy in the foreground is up to his eyeballs. All right. So however wrathful or violent you were against other people is the level of which you are in the river of boiling blood. Some people are up to their ankles and some people are completely submerged. And if you rise above your station, so if you're if you're up to your ankles and you stick your foot out, the uh, centaurs will shoot you with arrows. Next. And that's uh, like. These are the people of murder and assault. All right. Uh, next, we go into the wood of suicides. All right. And uh, the people that have committed suicide are now trees. And the harpies are uh, 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 eating at the trees. And the trees are bleeding. Next, we go to the sodomites, the usurers, and the blasphemers. All right. The sodomites are violent against nature. Usurers are uh, uh, crouching with money bags and around their necks, and they are all huddled together. A usurer is uh, somebody that um, uh, I think that's right. A usurer is somebody that uh, uh, lends money for profit. So they lend you money, but you have to pay it back with interest. If you lend money and then get the exact amount back, that's not usury. All right. So everybody, I want you to remember this guy right here, Reginaldo Degli Scrovegni. We'll talk about him later. So one of the things that Dante does is that he takes people that he knows that are committing these sins. And when he writes his book, he puts them in hell, right? He puts them as characters in hell that he talks to. All right, moving on. Uh, he goes in, then into the lower hell, all right, down at this deep abyss. And then we have the Simonists. Simony refers to the sin of attempting to exchange money for favors or power or positions in the Christian church. 
Then we have graft. The, <coughs> the misuse of a public position. These are people that are in a, a lake of boiling pitch. And uh, once again, however bad their, uh, their level was in, in real life is how bad they are in the boiling pitch. Some people are ankle deep. Some people are in over their heads. Then are the sowers of discord, people that try to create divisions between other people. And so what happens to them is that uh, I told you that this is on a ring, right? So it's a big circle and they're walking around the circle. And when they pass this demon here with the sword, he cuts them up into little pieces. And as they walk around uh, this circle, they slowly heal and they and they uh, finish healing right at the time where they pass the demon again and he cuts them up again for all eternity. Then we get down into the lowest part of hell. These are the betrayers of family, community, guests, and uh, lords. And these people are frozen in ice. And however bad their sin was is how bad or how deep they are in the ice. Some people are ankle deep. Some people are in up to their heads. Some people are completely submerged. And uh, Dante uh, berates uh, one of these people that he knew in real life. And then at the very center of hell is Satan, uh, and he has three heads, and in each mouth is a traitor. Uh, so let's see. Brutus and Longinus are betrayed Caesar. Uh, Judas is in the center, and uh, Judas betrayed Christ. Brutus and Longinus betrayed Caesar. So uh, they are the main ones. And I think it's funny that uh, you've heard this, the term when hell freezes over, all right, as a time that that's never going to happen. That always makes me laugh because according to Dante, hell is frozen. The reason why it's frozen is that's the farthest from God. Like God gives light and uh, without light, there is only cold and dark. All right. I told you this story to tell you about this next part right here, all right? So uh, there's this arena chapel that was right next to the uh, Scrovenia uh, Palace. All right, now he is the son of Reginaldo Degli Scro uh, let's see, Scrovenia. Do you remember that person that I told you to remember in the hell? He was a usurer. He was a real person that Dante wrote into hell. And uh, his son, seeing his father being portrayed in hell, got scared about going to hell. So uh, he created this chapel. He did not want to end up like his father in hell. So he created this arena chapel. By, and the paintings on the inside are painted by Giotto. So let's go inside. Lots of paintings. <clears throat> and we have these three rows of paintings. The top row is the life of Mary. The middle row is the life of Christ. And the bottom row is the passion of the Christ. That is his uh, crucifixion. <laughs> We're going to focus on one or two parts. A couple things I want to point out. There is a donor portrait. Remember, this guy is uh, holding, he's giving this copy of a church, this little model of a church to the Virgin Mary. And he's saying, here, I did this for you. All right, we're going to look at this one right here, the Lamentation. Christ has died. His mother is oh so sad. And she is crying over his dead body. Notice that his skin is rather greenish. Rigor mortis has set in. So he doesn't quite look very well. He has a cruciform halo. She does not. Christ is the only one with a cruciform halo. Mary Magdalene there is there with his feet. But here is something unusual and something different. And this is why I'm showing this to you. It, notice the two people that are in front of Christ. 
They have their backs to us. This is new. This is unusual. These figures give no uh, addition to the narrative. And their only purpose is to frame Jesus and Mary. And it also gives us a little bit of space. And then I also want to point out some of the angels that are up in the uh, sky. <coughs> and there's one that I want to point out is this one in the upper left. And well, these all three of them. Their arms are coming out towards us. The one on the right, the body is coming out towards us. And we can't see the feet because they are, uh, or the, the bottom because they are hidden by the, the wings. All right, there's space going on here. And that is called foreshortening. So do you remember how flat the Egyptian art was? Like it's everybody has been pressed up against two pieces of glass and we're looking at them through a microscope. All right. It's, it's flat. It doesn't uh, show any space whatsoever. So for shortening, look what happens with for shortening. If you take an arm and draw lines, vertical lines on the arm and then bring that arm towards you, that arm becomes shorter and shorter. Right. It looks shorter. But then the lines create these, instead of being straight lines, they uh, then go around the shape of the arm. All right, that is foreshortening. This kid has his finger pointing in your eyeball. The hand is so large because it is closer to us. We cannot see the rest of his arm because it is foreshortened. This is foreshortening. So in the past, the lamentation uh, was very flat, all right, and the uh, the body of Christ did not have things in front of it, all right. Also, we have Christ in the center versus Christ being on the left side. That is also new. This uh, diagonal right here is also something new, having a strong diagonal in there. The tree is a symbol of resurrection. All right, so we're going to finish part one. How are we doing on time? I don't think we're going to finish part two. All right, let's get out of this. Go to the next one. Part two. Slideshow from current slide. Come on. <clears throat> All right, let's go to Siena. What am I looking at? Siena. Let's... I'm just going to go real quick, see what's going on. Yeah. All right. I don't think we'll finish today. All right, let's go to Siena. We're going to go to the Siena Cathedral. Once again, notice this Italian style of having this white and green marble on the um, on the uh, the cathedral. And what would you call this piece right here? The tall tower. Does anybody remember? It's the Campanile. All right, but we need to move on. I'm spending too much time on this. All right, the uh, the altarpiece would have been right here. It's been photoshopped in here and but this is our Maesta altarpiece. All we have is the center panel. We do not have the top or the bottom. So they're just speculating as to what the top and the bottom would have looked like. And it was painted in response to Giotto's uh, Arena Chapel. All right. And again, the top and the bottom are gone. So let's take a look at the main panel. Down towards the bottom...
uh, is the artist signature. And then we have the local saints are up front. Angels are in the third row. And then we have a hierarchy of scale. Remember that from the first, uh, from earlier in uh, units one and two, that she is so much larger than everybody else. We have a much more naturalistic uh, light and shadow on this figure that before it had the, um, the gold paint for the highlights. We don't have that anymore. And the angels are looking at different directions. I think I want to move on to our next one. Okay, so we are in Florence now. And we're going to go to this building that has a the allegory of good government. And there are three paintings we're going to look at. The effects of good government in the city and in the country. and the allegory and effects of bad government in the city and in the country. These are the three paintings. And I'm going to stop here. And I want everybody to write slide 26 so that on Wednesday, when I ask you where we left off, tell me slide 26. All right. That'll be it for today. I was really hoping to get through unit three today. Oh, so sad.